Oh, hey guys. Let's see, where did we leave off? In Mr. Popper's Penguins, Chapter 11, Greta. So Captain Cook did not die after all. There were two penguins in the refrigerator, one standing and one sitting on the nest under the ice cubes. They're as like, they're as like as two peas, said Mr. Mrs. Popper. As two penguins, you mean, answered Mr. Popper. Yes, but which is which? At this moment, the standing penguin jumped out of the icebox, reached inside, and took one of the checkers from under the sitting penguin, whose eyes were closed in sleep, and laid it at Mr. Popper's feet. See, Mama, he's thanking me, said Mr. Popper, patting the penguin. At the South Pole, that's the way a penguin shows its friendship, only it uses a stone instead of a checker. This one must be Captain Cook, and he's, to tr he's trying to show that he's grateful to us for getting him Greta and saving his life. Yes, but how are we going to tell them apart? It's very confusing. I will go down in the cellar and get some white paint and paint their names on their black backs. And he opened the cellar door and started down, nearly tripping when Captain Cook unexpectedly tobogganed down after him. When he came up again, Mr. Popper had a brush and a small paint can in his hands, while the penguin had a white Captain Cook on his back. Goop, said Captain Cook, proudly showing his name to the penguin in the icebox. Gaw, said the sitting penguin, and then squirming around in her nest, she turned her back to Mr. Popper. So Mr. Popper sat down on the floor in front of the icebox, while Captain Cook watched, first with one eye, then with the other. What are you going to call her? asked Mrs. Popper. Greta. It's a nice name, said Mrs. Popper, and she seems like a nice bird, too. But the two of them fill the icebox, and pretty soon there will be eggs, and the next thing you know, the icebox won't be big enough for your penguins. Besides, you haven't done a thing about how I'm going to keep the food cold. I will, my love, promised Mr. Popper. It is already pretty cold for the middle of October, and will soon be cold enough outside for Captain Cook and Greta. Yes, said Mrs. Popper, but if you keep them outside the house, they might run away. Mama, said Mr. Popper, you put your food back in the icebox tonight, and we will just keep Greta and Captain Cook in the house. Captain Cook can help me move the nest into the other room. Then I will open all the windows and leave them open, and the penguins will be comfortable. They will be comfortable, all right, said Mrs. Popper, but what about us? We can wear our winter overcoats and hats in the house, said Mr. Popper, as he got up to go around and open all the windows. It certainly is colder, said Mrs. Popper, sneezing. The next few days were even colder, but the Poppers soon got used to sitting around in their overcoats. Greta and Captain Cook always occupied their chairs nearest the open windows. One night, quite early in November, there was a blizzard, and when the Poppers got up in the morning, there were large drifts of snow all over the house. Mrs. Popper wanted to get her broom and have Mr. Popper bring his snow shovel to clear away the drifts, but the penguins were having so much fun in the snow that Mr. Popper insisted it should be left where it was. In fact, he even went so far as to bring an old garden hose up from the basement and sprinkle all the floors that night until the water was an inch deep. By the next morning, all the Popper floors were covered with smooth ice, with snow drifts around the edges near the open windows. Both Greta and Captain Cook were tremendously pleased with all that ice. They would go up on the snow drift at one end of the living room and run down one behind the other, onto the ice until they were running too fast to keep their balance. Then they would flop on their stomachs and toboggan across the slippery ice. This amused Bill and Janie so much that they tried it too on the stomach of their overcoats. This in turn pleased the penguins greatly. Then Mr. Popper moved all the furniture in the living room to one side so the penguins and the children would have plenty of room for real sliding. It was a little hard at first to move the furniture because the feet of the chairs had frozen into the ice. Toward afternoon, the weather got warmer and the ice began to melt. Now, Papa, said Mrs. Popper, you really must do something. We can't go on like this. But Captain Cook and Greta are both fat and sleek, and the children have never been so rosy, 
It may be very healthy, said Mrs. Popper, as she mopped up the flood, but it's very untidy. I will do something about it tomorrow, said Mr. Popper. Chapter 12. More Mouths to Feed So the next day, Mr. Popper called an engineer and had a large freezing plant installed in the cellar and took Captain Cook and Greta down there to live. Then he had the furnace taken out and moved upstairs into the living room. It looked very hot there, but, as Mrs. Popper said, it was a relief, at least, not to have to wear their overcoats all the time. Mr. Popper was quite worried when he found that all these changes were going to be very expensive. Refrigerating engineer was worried, too, when he found that Mr. Popper had practically no money. However, Mr. Popper promised to pay as soon as he could, and the man let him have everything on credit. It was a good thing that Mr. Popper got the penguins moved when he did, because Mrs. Popper had been right about the eggs. The rookery had scarcely been moved to the basement when Greta laid the first egg. Three days later, the second one appeared. Since Mr. Popper knew that penguins lay only two eggs a season, he was astonished when, a little later, the third egg was found under Greta. Whether the change in climate had changed the penguins' ha breeding habits, Mr. Popper never knew, but every third day a new one would appear until there were ten in all. Now penguin eggs are so large that the mother can sit on only two at a time, and this created quite a problem. Mr. Popper solved it, however, by distributing the extra eggs under hot water bottles and electric heating pads, kept just at penguin body heat. The penguin chicks, when they began to hatch, were not so handsomely marked as their mother and father. They were fuzzy, droll little creatures who grew at a tremendous rate. Captain Cook and Greta were kept very busy bringing food to them, though, of course, the Poppers all helped, too. Mr. Popper, who had always been such a great reader, had no difficulty in thinking of names for the Penguin children. They were Nelson, Columbus, Louisa, Jenny, Scott, Magellan, Adelina, Isabella, Ferdinand, and Victoria. Still, he was rather relieved that there were no more than ten to name. Mrs. Popper, too, thought that this was about enough penguins for anybody, though they really did not make much difference to her in her housework, as long as Mr. Popper and the children remembered to close the cellar door in the kitchen. The penguins all loved to climb the stairs that led up to the kitchen, and never knew when to stop unless they found the kitchen door closed. Then, of course, they would turn around and toboggan down the steps again. This made rather a curious noise sometimes, when Mrs. Popper was working in the kitchen, but she got used to it, as she had got used to so many other strange things this winter. The freezing plant that Mr. Popper had got for the penguins downstairs was a large and good one. It made very large blocks of ice and a set of small ice cubes, so that soon Mr. Popper had made a sort of ice castle down there for the twelve penguins to live in and climb over. Mr. Popper also dug a large hole in the cellar floor and made a swimming and diving pool for the birds. From time to time, he would throw live fish into the pool for the penguins to dive for. They found this very refreshing, because, to tell the truth, they had got a little tired of canned shrimps. The live fish were specially ordered and were brought all the way from the coast in tank cars and glass boxes to 432 Proudfoot Avenue. Unfortunately, they were quite expensive. It was nice that there were so many penguins because when two of them, usually Nelson and Columbus, got into a fight and began to spar at each other with their flippers, the ten other penguins would all crowd around to watch the fight and make encouraging remarks. This made a very interesting little scene. Mr. Popper also flooded part of the cellar floor for an ice rink, and here the penguins often drilled like a sort of small army in fantastic marching movements and parades around the ice. The penguin Louisa seemed especially fond of leading these marching drills. It was quite a sight to see them. After Mr. Popper had the idea of training Louisa to hold a small American flag in her beak when she proudly led the solemn parades. Janie and Bill would often bring their little friends home from school with them, and they would all go down and watch the penguins for hours. At night, instead of sitting and reading and smoking his pipe in the living room as he had done before, 
Mr. Popper would put on his overcoat and take his things downstairs. There he would sit and read with his mittens on, looking up from time to time to see what his pets were doing. He often thought about the cold, distant regions in which the little creatures really belonged. Often, too, he thought how different his life had been before the penguins had come to keep him occupied. It was January now, and already he dreaded to think of the time when spring would come, and he would have to leave them all day and go back to painting houses. Well, that's all for today. Join us tomorrow to see what happens with Mr. Popper and his penguins. Hey, Mr. Bud, catch.